Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to worship with Christ United Methodists of Battle Creek. My name is Pastor Janet Wilson, and I'm pleased to be leading in worship this morning, whether you are here with us in person or watching online. We're pleased to have you with us. And it's fun to be joined this morning by my cousin Randy, who's a retired Mennonite pastor, and his wife Joy. And Randy, I don't know if you know this, but often your sister watches and joins us online since you've retired. <laughs> I seem to be the default. But just a reminder that people join from everywhere, and people do uh, join in digital worship in ways that we don't necessarily know about. So that is a gift to us on this somewhat rainy day in the midst of our holiday weekend may we just put all that we've come with aside uh, we will celebrate holy communion together this morning we're closing our series on the parables that we've been exploring all summer and we will just worship together with body mind heart and spirit on this day as diane leads us into worship Good morning, I'm Diane Garfield, lay leader here at Christ United Methodist Church. And what is today? This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Please join me in the call to worship. Let us start this service well by reminding ourselves that it is not we who choose Christ, but Christ who chose us. That we are not here because of our goodness, but because of Christ's grace, that we are not here to enlighten ourselves, but to allow Christ to enlighten us, that we have not come to be entertained, but to worship God with heart, soul, mind, and strength. Please pray with me. O oh God, you are the gathering one who calls us into community with each other to love and work, to support and heal. You are the gathering one who calls us into community with all people to bring justice and hope, freedom and truth. You are the gathering one who calls us into community with the whole creation to live in harmony, to cherish and renew. May we worship you with whole hearts on this day. Amen. Our first song today is Freely, Freely, and I think everyone knows this, so sing out loud.
come to a time of offering in our service of worship, a time where we give back to God of the resources shared with us. As you do this, may you give today as the Holy Spirit leads you to give, and may it be a time of blessing to you and to God as the ushers go through. And this is also the time to put your connection card in there if you would like to do that. Give with God. Please stand as you're comfortable and join in sharing prayer and praise in the singing of the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God all creatures here below. Alleluia, alleluia. Praise God the source of whose power uplifts, praise the Spirit, Holy Spirit, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Loving God, we thank you for the many gifts that we have been given even to this day. May these gifts be returned to you for your work through and in these people and this community of faith reaching out into the world as your disciples and your children. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we come to a time of prayer on this Labor Day weekend, reminded of all of those who do labor so hard many of us in this room are retired but some of us are not and we've had kind of a front row seat all summer to this big DOT project going on they've replaced all the curbs with uh, ADA accessible ones which in this really mobile neighborhood is a huge blessing and I've just watched those folks labor, whether it's 95 or 52 and all kinds of weather and all kinds of things and just feeling blessed by that. I think this week we get pavement, which will be even more exciting. But, you know, teachers and frontline workers and the people who serve us in the grocery store and um, Dollar General and Target and restaurants, people offer their gifts in so many ways as we all have through the course of our life. And may we just remember to pray for those folks as we go about our day to notice people, to look them in the eye, to see them as brothers and sisters um, in Christ and in humanity, and just to bless them. Often when someone isn't giving their best, we have no idea what kind of day they've had and what they've brought to that interaction. So it's one opportunity to be people of love and grace in the world as we have interactions with folks. So all that being said, my friends, let us pray together. Please be in prayer with me. 
loving God, we do thank you for labor, for the work that you have called us to do along the course of our lives, whatever that may have been, for the sustenance, the providence, the blessings that that has brought. May we remember others as they continue to labor. May you particularly bless the teachers that we have in our community and all those teachers just continuing to love children, to teach them, to lead them in such an uncertain time when they have second graders who are just entering a classroom for the first time. May you just give them the strength and the patience and the wisdom that they need in each day to make it through to reach one child, to have one light bulb moment in their classroom. And we know that as long as we are breathing, we are still laborers in your vineyard. May you give us the strength, the patience, the compassion, the wisdom to be who you are calling us to be in this time, to tell the stories that you call us to tell, to love the people that you put in our pathway. On this day, we pray for all who are grieving, who are struggling with illness or injury, with mental and physical health issues, and those who are tired and weary, who just need some rest. May that be present for them in this day and tomorrow. We offer you gratitude for this community of faith, for the work that you do have us do. May we continue to listen and lean in and follow you. We pray all of this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. The scripture lesson today comes from Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Jesus came near and spoke to them. I have received all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. Look, I myself will be with you every day until the end of this present age. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, that wasn't a parable, was it? <laughs> and today we come to the end of our summer series. We've been exploring the parables of Jesus and parables that reflect Jesus. I'm going to summarize a bit reminding us all of the journey we've taken, and then we'll talk a bit about where it might lead and connect to that scripture that Diane read. Jesus, who was teaching in his place and time as a Jewish teacher, taught often by telling stories. And one story form was the parable, a short story, sometimes just a sentence that illustrated a moral attitude, a religious principle, or a truth through reference to another phenomena, to the work of the earth, to people, to place. An allegory is another word with which we might be familiar where every element of the story stands for something else. Many parables are not quite that explicit, but just drop seeds themselves telling us what the kingdom of God looks like in a brief sentence or in an extended stories. And we've learned that as human beings, we respond more strongly to stories than to arguments or theories. None of us really love being told what to do by anyone, do we? Our brains seem to be hardwired to think in terms of narratives and parables usually affect us more deeply than simple principles stated out loud. 
we learn that there are 42 parables in the Gospels found scattered throughout Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And the word for parable, mashal, translates to side-by-side -side or parallel explanations. But it's also sometimes been used to define the hidden things that Jesus taught his disciples and crowds who followed him. But Jesus told stories to shine a light on what God and God's kingdom are really like, and sometimes what people in God's kingdom are really like. And parables are meant to make us consider and think. And there are parables about men and women cities and lakesides and roadways. They're about yeast and soil and bread and coins and working. They're about life. And if Jesus was directly teaching us now, he might be telling parables about the 24-7 news cycle and credit cards. He might be telling stories about social distancing and people with COVID and loving our neighbor. He might be telling parables about social media and polarization and kindness. Our challenge at times is to hear the story behind the parable story, the essential truth, and apply it to our own life in our own context. And parables were a very familiar tool in Jewish life and teaching in the synagogue and temple. There are parables in the Old Testament. And one Jewish commentator said this, the parable should not be lightly esteemed in our eyes, since by means of the parable, one arrives at the true meaning of the words of the Torah. The context of Jewish life and of the time are important to digging into the meaning of the parables in the gospel. Jewish scholar Amy Jill Levine says that if we get the context wrong, we'll get Jesus wrong as well. The parables are open-ended in their interpretation, will take place in every reading. We always hear them differently, but they are also historically specific. So we have to dig in and understand them enough to know how to apply them to our life. And Jesus told stories just to warm us up to ideas helping us deduce and figure out meanings together and on our own. He used parables to help us consider belief, prayer, witnessing, serving, loving our neighbor, and seeking forgiveness, among other things. And the gospel writers shared only a few of Jesus' explanations of parables, leaving them as open narratives in order to invite us into engagement with them. If everyone had been explained, we wouldn't have that work to do together in community, together in our own minds, in our own devotion, in our own relationship with Jesus. Each reader and each reading will bring a distinct message, and we may find that the same parable leaves different impressions on us and that we find different meanings at different times. Haven't we all found that over the course of our spiritual journeys, that the parable of the Good Samaritan means something different to me today than it did three years ago, than it did when I was feeling like I was the person in the ditch at the road rather than a passerby. And all of that is as it was meant to be even though we certainty-seeking humans find that a little frustrating from time to time. We want to understand what they are, but we have to seek that understanding. And through this summer, we've explored parables in several forms. We've looked at several of the parables of Jesus, the one of seed and soil, wheat and weeds, the parables of lost things, and of old and new things. And we looked at how parables are in other places, in fables, like the boy who cried wolf, one of those things we learned in life that taught us not to lie. In books and films, like The Wizard of Oz, the Star Wars, Ark, Harry Potter, The Lord of the Rings, places we wouldn't 
necessarily expect to find parables in God, but we can. In song, remembering that we explored Harry Chapin's The Cats in the Cradle. We looked at parables as an art and present in the form of art, including Charles Schultz cartoon, the Peanuts cartoon, and last week, the parables of Dr. Seuss. A smeech is a smeech. We are all children of God. So parables have come in lots of shapes and forms through this summer, and the intention behind that was just to open our eyes a bit to story and the place of story in our lives. And I hope along the way that we remembered that everyone loves a good story in whatever form it comes. Mark and I often come out of an episode of This Is Us, one of our favorite TV shows, saying, man, that is good writing. Wow, that was a good story. And stories can be found there. They can be found in the biography of someone who interests you, the story of their life. And they can be found in the stories that we tell one another about a great game that we watched or were a part of, the fish that got away and the love of our life who didn't, stories about how our children were born, the family stories of the Christmas without presents or the burnt popcorn or the rainiest camping trip ever. You have family stories that you tell again and again, stories that are funny or poignant or human. And the Bible is a collection of poems, songs, letters, and stories about who we are and who God is and who we are together. The Bible is a book about how to be human, a human who God loves as God has loved humans across time and space, and a book about how to be a specific human called you, created to love God in this time, in this place, I suppose that God could have created a list of rights and wrongs and do's and don'ts, an actual instruction manual. There are instructions in the Bible, and some of them translate well to all people and all times, but some of them sound like the ones that you get in ready-to-assemble furniture from Ikea, the ones you can tell were initially written in another language, the ones that leave you with too few pieces or extra pieces and something that just all feels a little bit wobbly. Instead of producing a detailed instruction manual, what God has done instead is to repeatedly pull us, God's beautiful, squirmy, questioning, sticky children, onto his lap, her lap, their lap, and say, let me tell you a story. Let me tell you a story about how the world was created. Let me tell you a story about what it means to be my people. Let me tell you a story about a father called Abraham, a mother named Mary, a queen called Esther, a disciple named Peter. Let me tell you a story about someone who loses everything, who has an affair, who doubts in me, who is lost, who is faithful, who is faithless, who held a miracle in their arms. Let me tell you a story about when I came down to earth as one of you, as a baby born to a peasant mother, a human named Jesus. So it should be of absolutely no surprise to us that Jesus, this baby, this son of God, also tells stories. Jesus' teaching in his time and place teaches by doing. He calls people to follow. He heals people. He sees and engages with women and lepers and tax collectors. He feeds multitudes. He calms storms. He brings people back to life. And he debates with those who seem to really like the instruction manual approach a little bit too much. In the doing, he shows us what the kingdom of God looks like. Jesus, teaching in his time of place, teaches by telling stories as parables. 
And in those parables, he tells us what the kingdom of God looks like again and again. In God's creative followers, poets, writers, composers, artists, and humans of every kind, stories of Jesus and interpretations of parables have continued. There is no period of the story of God. There's no denouement or plot twist or cliffhanger or happily ever after in God's story with us. There is just life among God's peopley people. Over the last couple of weeks, I've seen a lot of Facebook posts about student loan forgiveness. And some of them have been about entitlements and paying your debts and earning your way in the world. Some of them have been about the false promise of higher education and the lived reality of a debt hard to bear or repay. And I'm sure we all have a thought or an opinion about this. But from a couple of pastor friends, I've seen this post just reminding us of perhaps a lesson learned in a parable. But the older, older brother grew angry. Why do we celebrate? I worked hard to pay back all my loans. But this son of yours, you have forgiven all of his. The father said, my son, you are already debt free. We had to celebrate. This brother of yours was buried in debt and is now forgiven. He was dead and he is now alive. Just something to think about. It made me stop and think for a moment. And life will continue to bring us new circumstances, thoughts, issues, and places in our journey where we will need to, or at least want to, respond and react. And parables, my friends, again, are made to make us stop and think. Not just about what Jesus may have meant in his time, but what his words might mean in our time. At the end of his time on earth, as the resurrected Christ, Jesus talked once more with his disciples. And the last passage in the Gospel of Matthew is Diane read, It says this, Jesus came near and spoke to them. I received all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. Look, I myself will be with you every day until the end of this present age sent them to make disciples of all nations and here we are two millennia later disciples seeking to make disciples of Jesus and the stories and the parables have been told generation after generation through war and famine and plague and changes that never end think of life in Jesus time and life till now and all of the changes changes and changes that have come. There couldn't be a book big enough to give us instructions to deal with all of these changes. Instead, we have stories. As we follow him, we show who Jesus is through our actions, the fruit of the Spirit, and living out love and grace and compassion in Jesus' name. And as we follow him, we tell who Jesus is through our stories, through our telling and our reflection of the Jesus stories that we know and hear from the Bible, and the Jesus stories that we know from our lives. We all have Jesus stories in our lives, stories of the flow of things in the universe, as I often see them in the life of the church, where things come and we feel inundated, and then they just go to people who need them stories of grace given in unexpected times and places and stories of miracles seen in our lives. Stories from our life together as a community of faith and stories from our individual and our family lives. May we
people of God, remember Jesus and his stories as we write our own story with God for this time. May we remember Jesus' essential truths of loving our neighbor and loving God. And may we, people of God, live out our story, trusting in God to help reveal the truth that lives within them. Please pray with me. Loving God, we thank you for the parables of Jesus that we've studied and followed through the summer and through our time as your followers. May we continue to dig deep to understand, to have them resonate in our lives and our minds and hearts and spirits at unexpected times when life brings us something new. We have these old stories to help us know where you are and how to follow. May you be with us as we continue to write our own stories with you. May you help us to tell them freely and joyfully to those who need to hear the good news. And in all of this, may we continue just to hear your essential truths speak to us in every day. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we prepare for communion, we're going to um, kind of watch and sing a song of preparation together. The ushers will distribute the elements during this time, but we ask you just to hang on to them, and then we'll tell that story and celebrate communion together.
Holy Communion is always about remembrance, remembering the story that we'll tell in a moment. But it also points us to that central truth, central truth around which we live our faith, the crucifixion, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The ability to live freely from sin, to put down all that we have done, to know that we are human when we make mistakes, and God forgives us and loves us. And I'll first say that communion in the United Methodist Church is open to all. This is the Lord's Supper, the Lord's table. You may receive as you choose by your presence here this morning. And we'll begin just laying down what those things are, our sins, our faults, our failures. I just call it the the clutter that are, is between God and I on this morning. And so we'll just take some moments in silence for each of us to be in conversation with God, to lay those down at his feet as we come to his table on this morning. Please be in prayer. Lord, we thank you for your forgiveness, for your peace and your grace that flows so freely. There's nothing we can do to deserve it. How can we but offer our thanks and our prayer in response? May we continue to follow you in love, faith, and trust every day. In Jesus' name we pray. And in the name of Christ, you and I, my friends, are forgiven. So we come to the table, and it's always about the telling of stories, the story of the Last Supper, a story that is told about Jesus and his disciples, a story in which Jesus uses the metaphor that we carry to this day, so we kind of come with that lens and that those ears on this morning, remembering that Jesus on the night in which he gave himself up for us was having a meal, a feast, a celebration of Passover with his disciples and his friends. And at the end of this time of ritual and blessing and eating and drinking, he did a new thing, as Jesus often did. And he took a piece of bread and he broke it and he said, This is my body, which will be broken for you. Whenever you are together, take it and eat and remember me. And he took a new cup of wine and he blessed it. And he said, this is my blood, which will be spilled for you. Whenever you are together, take and drink and remember. We can only imagine the puzzlement of the disciples on that day and what those words meant to them in the days and weeks ahead as well as what they mean to us as we carry that story through our lives as disciples. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here that we may eat and drink and remember that we may be your disciples in ministry to each other and to all the world in your name. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry 
to all the world. And now with the confidence of the children of God as storytellers in the name of Christ, let us pray the prayer Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So at this time, my friends, this is the body of Christ broken for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. Take and eat and remember. we close our time in worship today, we're just reminded that Jesus invites us to follow in all these stories and becoming free and fresh and unburdened again are so that we may follow freely and that we may follow where he leads. Please join in the closing hymn, page 338, Where He Leads Me.
that's a perfect place to end <laughs> this series and on this day as we follow Jesus. May we just continue to tell the stories that Jesus told, the stories that were told about Jesus and the stories that God is telling through our own lives as we continue to go into the world making disciples and sharing the good news. Go in grace and peace, my friends. Have a wonderful Memorial Labor Day. That'd be the way back. Labor Day. <laughs> I want to start the summer over, so Memorial Day would be okay, but Labor Day and have a blessed week ahead. Amen.